Good afternoon again. I know it's the last panel. Come on, guys. We got to wake up. Come on. So we're at panel four this afternoon. Um, we have three papers. The title of this panel is Past and Promise, and I think you'll understand why uh, that topic was chosen um, after you hear the papers. We have three speakers. Their bios are in the program, and they will speak in the order in which they are listed on the program. So our first speaker will be Kristen Peterson from the University of California, Irvine, followed by David Jones from Harvard University, followed by Isaac Warbrick from Auckland University of Technology in New Zealand. Let's see if I can fix this. Well, uh-oh, this is too big. Hi, everyone. Thanks for hanging around in the final stretch. Um, I uh, want to thank uh, Professor Roberts and Aram for inviting me and also for the really the great care that they've both brought to welcoming us today. Um, I also want to mention that this is a, a co-authored piece. Um, I did this research with uh, Professor Marenica Folalion, who is um, at Obafemi Awalawa University in Nigeria. Okay. Um, in 2004, the first multi-sided clinical trials were conducted to determine if an antiretroviral drug, tenofovir, could be taken to prevent HIV transmission, a biomedical technology known as pre-exposure prophylaxis, or PrEP. Now, before the trials began, AIDS researchers characterized PrEP as a necessary humanitarianism for which researchers were ethically compelled to save the world's poorest, especially Africans from the scourge of AIDS. But as soon as the trials began to recruit volunteers, controversy erupted at most of the trial sites, which were located at research institutions in Phnom Penh, Cambodia, Yaoundé, Cameroon, Accra, Ghana, Lilongwe, Malawi, Ibadan, Nigeria, and Bangkok, Thailand. Although disputes differ somewhat across locales, they all circled around the ethics and scientific rationales outlined in the trial protocol. Yet the trial designers and implementers did not recognize these disputes as actual ethical claims. While officials in Malawi outright refused ethical approval, actors including research scientists, AIDS activists, injection drug user advocacy organizations, and a national sex worker union at the host sites in Cambodia, Cameroon, Nigeria, and Thailand attempted to negotiate a new and modified protocol design with the sponsors and the organizers of these trials. And the aim was to enable the protocol to map onto the health realities at each site. And so when this failed to happen, three of the sites shut down, leading to one of the biggest controversies that the world of AIDS research and activism experienced. And so in this talk, I, I'm going to detail the events that unfolded in Ibadan, Nigeria, for which an ethical controversy erupted unlike any other. Now, social scientists have long discussed the background and context of offshore research, right? When I say offshore, I mean that they originate um, usually in the US and they're um, offshore to um, sites where it's cheaper to conduct the research. Um, in, very, in various parts of Africa and Asia, uh, increasingly Latin America. Um, and what they've described is the, his, the history and the circumstances of power differentials found between trial coordinators located at the US and global institutions and trial participants who often live at the margins of society where the host institution is located. But the question not yet on the table is this. After decades of multiple highly publicized ethics controversies, followed by new international standards for clinical trial impl implementation, why do claims of ethical violations, especially throughout Africa, continue to persist? And in this particular PrEP case, why is there no ethical crisis when recognition of et ethical claims fails to happen? So in order to answer these questions, we look beyond dyadic interactions and encounters typically found in clinical research, and instead we're interested in the structure of the ethical, which is configured within two forms of merged capitalism, racial capitalism and pharmaceutical capitalism. 
So Cedric Robinson in 1983 argued that racial capitalism does not homogenize workers and labor across place per se, but expands by seizing upon colonial divisions, identifying particular regions for productions and others for neglect, certain populations for exploitation and still others for disposal. As an exemplary form of racial capitalism, brand name pharmaceutical companies deliberately eliminated their African markets once 1980s structural adjustment policies, that is, and I'm not gonna get into that here, just extreme austere economic liberalization, were in, implemented throughout the continent. The outcome in African countries was the tanking of industrial and pharmaceutical markets and the severe decline of healthcare systems. So at the same time that African economies declined, the drug industry was facing its own financial pressures and other pressures, including patent expirations, very few new drug pipelines, and decreasing profits. Wall Street investment firms extended capital to drug companies while simultaneously demanding high and unprecedented rates of annual appreciation, which for just about every drug company are are structurally impossible for the industry to meet. This created an incentive to abandon African pharmaceutical markets. So at the same time that this was all happening, so we're talking around 1980s, 1990s, there were new technologies that be became available, especially combinatorial chemistry, which enabled the rapid production of infinite numbers of chemical combinations. An exponential increase in new molecules and accompanying patent applications sub subsequently flooded the US Patent Office. And increasingly, global AIDS activism that demanded treatment for all coincided with promising new compounds that needed new humans for testing, especially for HIV drugs. And so given the cost-saving obsessions of the drug industry, trying to make it in its new financialized world, we begin to see an, in, an exponential increase in the offshoring of molecules by the early 2000s, right? So what I'm trying to do here is kind of give you a sense of the structural logics of off, offshore research that begins roughly in the 1970s, and I've completely abbreviated this, and I can elaborate more in the Q&A. Um, what I will do now is explain the controversy that arose between 2004 and 2005, and then consider how the racial is actually embedded in politi the political economy of trials in ways that open up questions about ethics and clinical research. So the first trip the first PrEP trial closure occurred in August 2004 in Cambodia, and the news instantly traveled across um, various um, AIDS activist listserv across the world. And so when the details reached the national Nigeria AIDS listserv, which um, is called the AIDS eForum, and it's hosted by an NGO called Journalists Against AIDS, um, subscribers posted questions on the status of the Nigeria sister trial site. The new HIV AIDS Vaccine and Microbicides Advocacy Society, or NAVMAS, led the debate. And here on this slide, I, there's so many actors involved, I just am laying these out so you can kind of get a sense of the, of the, of the many moving parts. Um, NAVMAS is an HIV prevention NGO made up of Nigerian scientists, which scrutinizes HIV-related offshore trial protocols. Family Health International is an international NGO and social marketing firm. It's now called FHI360. Um, it designed the trial, and FHI's local research partners at the University College of Medicine at the University of Ibadan in Nigeria conducted the trial. The Gates Foundation and others uh, funded these trials. So for NAVMAS, the news of the Phnom Penh closure was not surprising. Several months prior, it attempted to obtain more information about the Nigerian PrEP trial without any success. And so with no tri trial protocol to evaluate, NAVMAS used the Nigeria AIDS eForum to publicly ask FHI for the trial protocol and the informed consent documents. Three days later, on September 6, 2004, FHI's Elizabeth Robinson replied with a kind of frequently asked questions guide that did not get to the heart of the concerns being posted. 
Moreover, FHI stated that the PrEP study was designed according to the most rigorous interna international ethical standards and received ethics approval from FHI and African institutions. And also stated was that those who became HIV positive on the trial would be referred to treatment sites within Nigeria. Now, the responses to this post were quite instant, and many people indexed very well-known and scandalous Nigerian clinical trial histories. Subscribers reported on little trust in most, most African ethics review boards and well-known healthcare referral problems, which aroused a great deal of anger. Thus, FHI's extended assurances of good ethical conduct were met with a continued demands for documentation which were not forthcoming. So the moment that FHI posted to the Nigeria AIDS eForum, it became a site of daily intense debate for the next six weeks. So as the debate continued, Navmas reached out to colleagues in Europe and throughout Africa and it, because they couldn't get a hold of the trial protocol and eventually they did, get, they did find it through various colleagues. And after analyzing it, the scientists and the ethicists at Navmas post, produced a lengthy um, list of concerns and informed the PI and the IRB at the university in October 2004. Now, these included the following. I'm not going to get into them because I know I'll go crazy over my time. But I, I want to note on this slide here, here's a list of, of the scientific rationales. This is just a partial list that um, Navmas was concerned with things like drug resistance not being monitored, um, previous um, uh, clinical research on safety, you know, testing malaria, co-infection, things like this were very important. And then there were some other things that were not necessarily science, but more in the realm of bioethics, things like no female condoms, um, no MOU to supply tenofovir, no community liaison, things like that. And very importantly, no, if, if someone becomes positive on the trial, there would be no care and support provisions that were outlined in the protocol. So, so after... Um, so after uh, this list and this uh, letter was sent, um, uh, Navmas evaluated the protocol and sent it to the PIs um, at UCH and stated that even though future HIV prevention trials were important and needed to be pursued, the tenofovir prep pile was deemed by this organization as not necessary. It argued that there was not strong enough evidence to suggest PrEP was technologically appropriate for the trial community or that there was potential for widespread implementation. Um, there was not potential for widespread implementation in Nigeria. So the university IRB committee then reconvenes and indicated that most of these concerns would be included in the trial. But not considered for revision were the issues pertaining to the scientific rationales like safety profiles, monitoring resistance, et cetera. And so after several months of, and, and what the IRB said was, look, we will take your concerns, we agree with you, we're gonna um, go to FHI and ask them to um, consider revising the protocol. So after several months of waiting, no protocol modification took place. Navmas drafted another letter to FHI and UCH, <clears throat> excuse me, and this time included the Minister of Health and the Nigerian Drug Regulatory Agency, um, and they reiterated their concerns. Um, this was by now March 2005. And in this letter, it included new evidence that Preclinical data conducted by CDC scientists showed, in Navmas's view, little to no promise as a prevention technology in primates. But two days before the letter was sent, FHI shut down the trial. Ward Cates of FHI explained that, quote, FHI identified serious ongoing procedural irregularities in the conduct of the study. In other words, the the Nigerian uh, team was effing up the trial, right? So we actually interviewed one person working on this arm of the PrEP trial who concurred that there were several problems that, uh, with trial implementation. We consulted the Nigerian regulatory officials at NAFDOC to substantiate whether it, these irregular, uh, irregularities that uh, Kate's referred to were standard across clinical trials. And we were informed by FHI that we were informed that um, FHI never submitted any documents, 
and that NAFDAQ claims that during their three monitoring visits, no in-progress reports were made available to the regulatory agency, leaving it unable to evaluate the trial and unable to determine why it was shut down. So the problems that Nigerian scientists found in the protocol were most likely not a surprise to those who constructed and financed these trials. In 2001, three years before the trials even commenced, the Gates Foundation held a meeting to discuss FHI's proposal to initiate this PrEP study in human participants. The issues raised at the meeting revolved around the very same issues that concerned Nigerian scientists, the lack of data available on, tenof on tenofovir safety in HIV-negative persons, the choice in the form of the drug, et cetera, et cetera. And like the Nigerian scientists, the 2001 Gates consultation concluded that it was not appropriate to conduct offshore trials without first attending to these issues. But instead of following these suggestions, FHI chose to implement the trial anyway, based upon its own humanitarian reasoning. So for example, FHI asked itself, will the host country populations benefit from the research results, among other questions that imagined that FHI could mitigate various health problems through a PrEP trial? So after... Okay. After three closures, trial closures, in Cambodia, Cameroon, and Nigeria, a refused IRB approval in Malawi, a trial marred by claims of Geneva Convention violations, that was in Thailand, the Gates Foundation, uh, UNAIDS, and FHI got concerned about the future of HIV prevention research. And so in May 2005, they organized a series of regional and international consult consultative meetings to deal with this breakdown. Um, we attended the Nigeria meeting, there was one held in Nigeria, and there was agreement between international and local actors to implement community engagement mechanisms that would provide HIV clinical education to trial communities and their advocates. But Nigerian scientists and AIDS advocates additionally made calls to negotiate the trial design at the moment it is conceptualized by foreign researchers, which was not convincing to foreign actors in the room, including the meetings moderator. Certainly, a negotiation like this does not guarantee the successful acceptance or completion of a trial, and there exists the potential for a host community to deem it unnecessary, which happened in Nigeria and Malawi. But the meetings in Geneva and Seattle rescaled the stakes of the problem at hand. They were geared towards developing what were called effective partnerships, imagined to take place between communities defined as ADA activists, sex workers, and their advocates, and researchers defined only as PrEP researchers and not African scientists residing outside of these transnational research partnerships. And in completely bypassing concerns over the trial's scientific rationales raised by NAVMAS and other sites, the PrEP researchers insisted that communities were ignorant of HIV clinical scientists and that activists acted on misinformation leading to the PrEP trial closures. They also insisted that many actors could, could only have been instructed to protest by activists in the global north, and so ACT UP Paris was actually singled out as the main culprit. So the discourse of African and South Asian ignorance about HIV clinical science was so powerful at these meetings, and for years, future HIV prevention readings, it's like the origin story of HIV uh, prevention research, that it effectively appeared as if the ethical claims made at each of these sites never happened. Okay, so how much? Okay, all right. So there's a lot to unpack, and I'm, um, in the remaining time, I just want to come back to this question I began with. Why is there no ethical crisis when recognition of ethical claims fails to happen? And to so explain this, I want to think about how the racial is structurally configured here. And when I say the racial, I'm, it's not meant um, strictly as sort of multicultural difference, right, which, as, which is often connoted with the term race. Rather, the racial here is an architectonic of reason, as Nahum Chandler puts it. And what he's thinking, he's thinking through Kant, who, as many of you might know, um, was obsessed with race. He, he gave more lectures on uh, the human races than any other uh, topic in his career. 
Um, there's others who have talked about this, of course, Césaire in his discourse on colonialism, Said on the reiterative nature of Orientalism, Cedric Robinson on um, uh, what he's called racial regimes. So this is the kind of second order or the structural iteration of race. And that is the racial has long been embedded in modern thought and modern institutions that emerge out of European philosophical foundations. In other words, racism has long been instantiated into the epistemology and ontology of modern man with a capital M. When transposed specifically to African contexts, ideological and intellectual precepts takes Africa's racialized difference as a priori and therefore make any articulation or interrogation of its racialized realities appear redundant, as Jemima Pierre has pointed out. And so, why was it not only easy to reframe the PrEP discussion as a problem of ignorant activists and incompetent researchers, but also why was it readily believable, right? It did not occur to anyone in the PrEP trial community to ask Nigerian regulatory officials about why the trial closed, nor did they seek out actual official reports from NAFDAQ. Rather, FHI's own explanation became more authoritative and believable than an African regulatory agency. So it was unthinkable to the PrEP consortium that actual ethical claims were being made. It was unthinkable that various black publics, in the largest extent of that term, um, could actually analyze scientific rationales, much less had the, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, trial protocols, or, or much less had the impetus to do so. It was also unthinkable that a transnational offshore HIV research consortium must be accountable to an African regulatory agency. And so, to be clear, unthinkability is the racial foundation of an ethical imaginary. And I'm using the term unthinkable in the same way that Triot did in his work on the Haitian Revolution. So again, coming back to the racial as this sort of architecture of reason. So to conclude here, I just quickly want to say that we use the term ethical misrecognition to account for why there is no ethical crisis when the recognition of ethical claims fails to happen over and over again. And we are not referring to the thing of ethics, such as clinical aberrations or misunderstandings among parties. Rather, ethical misrecognition is exemplary, exemplary of racial reasoning located in modern constructs of knowledge. It is entangled in, in the foundational violence of ra racialized subjectivities and imperial power. It has the persistent ability to mythologize ethics as, uni as a universal liberal construct imagined to be available to everyone. Yet ethical misrecognition indexes the power to exclude and obscure, not as an ethical aberration, but as a modern political strategy of global racial orders. Thank you. Again, as with the other speakers, I'd like to thank our hosts for the invitation to speak here today. I've been fascinated by the talks, and as you'll see, there are many connections uh, between the talks that you've heard so far and what I will say uh, in the next 20 minutes. For the sake of time, I will try to stay on my own script and hope you will see the connections yourself or at least bring them up in the discussion. I should also say that this is collaborative work done with Elizabeth Helho, who I couldn't get to join us on the stage. Uh, is a project we've been working on uh, for several years now, uh, and welcome the feedback as we try to bring this to fruition. <clears throat> Over the past 50 years, a remarkable claim has gained traction in the medical literature. Of all the world's populations, South Asians are at the greatest risk for coronary artery disease. Some advocates warn that coronary hospitalization rate of South Asians is four times higher than any other ethnic population. Others assert that South Asians account for 60% of all cardiovascular deaths worldwide. Now, neither claim is true, or even close to true, but that does not stop newspapers from trumpeting the risk. One Stanford cardiologist, eager to address or to capitalize on this health inequity, established a specialty clinic in 2014, the Stanford South Asian Translational Heart Initiative, or SAFI, a play on the Hindi word for partner, conveniently located near a series of IT hubs in the Silicon Valley area. 
As this discourse on South Asian susceptibility emerged, medical researchers grappled with both temporality and identity. Researchers who deploy state-of-the-art genomics and reassure their patients with promissory claims of personalized medicine also find insight in antiquity. Sharaka and Shushruta, in India's ancient medical authorities, supposedly described symptoms of heart attacks 2,800 years before. This has convinced some modern pathologists that heart disease and diabetes were already health problems in classical India, suggesting a measure of genetic susceptibility in the Indian population. Identity has been equally troublesome. What does South Asian mean? The Safi Clinic at Stanford welcomes anyone with roots in India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, Bhutan, the Maldives, or Sri Lanka, places that represent a quarter of the world's population and places famous in the public imagination for their entrenched distinctions of religion and caste. So does it make sense to say that all South Asians really are at risk from India's subsistence farmers in rural areas to Silicon Valley's IT entrepreneurs? It is useful to explore narratives of temporality and identity in the literature on South Asian coronary disease and the ways in which they are deployed both to frighten and to reassure. Competing imaginaries complicate efforts to define and deploy appropriate medical and public health responses to this apparent epidemic. Now, in terms of the history, long after it had become the leading cause of death in Europe and North America, coronary artery disease remained rare in India. In 1962, Delhi cardiologist Siva Ramakrishnan Padmavati reported that the percentage of hospital admissions due to coronary disease in Delhi was the lowest in the world, just 0.2%, compared with 26.2% in Minneapolis and St. Paul. This low incidence fueled a discourse of race and economic development that paralleled what had happened in the United States with African Americans. Indians, like African Americans, were assumed to be too primitive to suffer coronary disease, the archetype disease of civilization. As Bombay physician Rustam Jal wrote in 1949, Hindus appear relatively more immune to coronary disease. Whether this is due to their being, to a large extent, strict vegetarians and their dietetic habits, or to their more placid dispositions with less sensitive nervous systems, one cannot say. Very striking parallels to the race discourse in the US a decade before. The situation, however, soon changed. By 1955, Vakil had described coronary disease as a growing menace in India. Any doubts about its relevance disappeared on May 27, 1964, when Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru died of a heart attack. This rise in coronary disease surprised no one. Theorists of the epidemiological transition predicted that coronary disease would emerge as economic conditions improved in developing countries worldwide. <clears throat> Boston cardiologist Paul Dudley White had warned Delhi's Sujo Roy in 1961 that, quote, there are probabilities that coronary heart disease will be on the increase as India gradually becomes more prosperous. India, however, presented researchers with many puzzles. Rates of coronary disease varied across the subcontinent in ways that did not correlate with known risk factors. One study of the one million workers in the Western Railway Service found the highest rates of coronary disease in southern India. This made no sense. It was in the Punjab in the north, where Indians most resembled Americans with high consumption of fat, meat, and cigarettes. And they had a hard time explaining the prevalence of coronary disease in the non-smoking vegetarians of South India. Confusion deepened as epidemiologists studied the South Asian diaspora. Careful studies of Japanese immigrants to Hawaii and California had showed the coronary disease risk increased as the migrants adopted the diet and customs of their new homes. This had convinced researchers that the between population differences in coronary rates are environmentally rather than genetically determined. <laughs> South Asian immigrants behaved differently. Studies in Singapore, Fiji, South Africa, England, Uganda, and Trinidad had all found that South Asian immigrants had the highest rates of coronary disease and this risk existed regardless of their degree of acculturation. Michael Marmot, who went on to have an illustrious career, began his career studying these South Asians in London and found that they had higher rates of coronary disease than the local London population, whether they were rich or poor, smokers or non-smokers, or vegetarians or meat eaters. This again made no sense. As Marmot 
argued, Indian populations overseas originate from several different parts of the subcontinent and are likely to be genetically dissimilar. It is not obvious how the consistent findings of high rates of diabetes and coronary disease can be reconciled with either environmental or genetic explanations. Researchers struggled to explain this South Asian paradox, the high prevalence of coronary disease in South Asians regardless of their risk factors. Marmot focused on a possible underlying risk factor, insulin re resistance and diabetes, but of course that begged the question of why were they at increased risk of diabetes. Southampton epidemiologist David Barker showed that fetal malnutrition led to physiological adaptations that increased risk of hypertension and coronary disease in adults, the Barker hypothesis. Surgeons blamed Indian small coronary arteries. Others noted that South Asians had, to, had a hard to treat distribution of atherosclerotic plaques, a diffuse and distal pattern that was more characteristic of American women. Explicit comparisons between Indian men and American women. Researchers inevitably turned to genetics. The logic was simple. Quote, the failure of risk factors to explain the increased prevalence of cardiovascular disease in South Asia suggests a strong genetic causation that needs active characterization. In subsequent years, they have identified several suspects, including lipoprotein A and APOC3 prom promoter and myosin binding protein C, C3. One deletion in MYBB C3 is supposedly, and not credibly, responsible for 45% of sudden heart attack deaths, even though it's not that prevalent in the population. Researchers justify their attention to genetics by invoking James Neal's thrifty gene hypothesis. Now, these, the, the main two risk stories that circulate rely on different historical narratives. The thrifty gene hypothesis invokes imagery of India as the land of ancient famines. Ancestral populations experienced more frequent and dire famines than other humans, leaving them with thriftier genes and increased susceptibility to coronary disease. The Barker hypothesis relies on rapid economic development, with people suffering from a mismatch between their fetal and adult nutritional environments. While well, one theory is genetic the, and the other developmental, both involve the temporality of an epidemiological transition. But again, this begs this question, does it even make sense to conceptualize South Asians as a natural kind that shares a unique susceptibility to coronary disease? Now, the bewildering complexity of South Asian populations has long stymied would-be rulers, ethnographers, and medical researchers. British colonial ethnologists and phrenologists attempted to fit South Asians into their emerging racial taxonomies and hierarchies. Indians defied simple efforts at classification with identities that might be grounded in caste, lineage, locale, religion, occupation, sectarian networks, or military affiliation. Linguists noted one division between the Aryans in the North and Dravidians in the South, but colonial scholars debated whether ancestry, culture, diet, or environment mattered the most. Many distinctions found their way into medical theory. While the Punjabi impressed the British with their martial vigor, the Bengali did not. As T.B. Macaulay complained in 1843, the Bengali is feeble even to effeminacy. This racial construct of manly Punjabi and effeminate Bengali was invoked to explain the higher rates of diabetes in Bengal and the inability of Bengali to tolerate routine doses of quinine for malaria. And this history sheds in intriguing light on the feminized accounts of Indian coronary disease that circulate today. Now, as Indians fought for independence from the British Empire in the first half of the 20th century, the question of whether Indians were a natural kind became fraught. Britain's exit strategy, partition, triggered one of the century's great human tragedies. What was once British India, and of course it hadn't always been British India, it had been many countries before, uh, is now many countries again. India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, Bhutan, Myanmar, the Maldives, and Sri Lanka. Despite a constitutional ban on caste, India itself remains stratified by caste, class, ethnicity, language, and many other markers of difference. Cardiac researchers have long recognized the value of this diversity. As Padmavati wrote in Delhi in 1962, India is a fertile ground for the cardiovascular epidemiologist. It offers great variety in ethnic groups and food habits. The population in the north is a mixture of the original Indo-Aryans with successive waves of invaders from the Northwest. That in the South is not quite so mixed, a large Dravidian element still being present. In addition, there are, so, there are many so-called aboriginals with the primitive ways of life. These differences have contributed to variations in coronary disease incidence across India, from just 6% of cardiac cases in the Himalayas to 23% in Amritsar in the Punjab. 
when Western researchers began their studies of Indian diaspora communities, they sometimes attended to this diversity. Marmot's team had a nuanced understanding of the varieties of South Asian in London. As he wrote, smoking rates range from very low in the Gujarati women in Brenton Harrow to high in the Bangladeshi men in the Tower Hamlets. Most, Asi most Asians in Brenton Harrow are vegetarian, whereas the Muslim communities of the Tower Hamlets and Waltham Forest are generally not. Now, recognition of this diversity sometimes left researchers anxious. People understood that South Asians in Singapore came from Tamil Nadu and Kerala, while those in England came mostly from North India. And it was hard to imagine how all migrants from the sub subcontinent could share an elevated risk. Researchers had repeatedly rejected the utility of the concept of South Asian. A 1994 re review reminded its readers that words such as South Asian, Asian, Indo-origin are umbrella terms. They do not accurately describe a group of people who are diverse not only in geographical origin, but also in religion, culture, and dietary habits. A 2014 in overview of Indian genomics described India as a treasure for geneticists and evolutionary biologists due to its vast human diversity, consisting of more than 4,500 anthropologically well-defined populations, castes, tribes, and religious groups. Each population differs in terms of endogamy, language, culture, physical features, geographic and climatic position, and genetic architecture. But this overview itself, titled Unity and Diversity, sent mixed messages. And these are the kinds of plots that you saw earlier. Comparisons of Indian populations to other groups showed the Indians to be a distinct cluster uh, from the other human populations. But analyses, if you zoom in on that cluster, showed significant differentiation within India, quote, large enough to warrant care in selecting patients and controls for genomic epigenomic investigations. Even studies that acknowledge South Asians as, quote, a heterogeneous population often proceed to lump them together. As this study concluded, multiple studies of migrant South Asian populations have confirmed a three to five fold increased risk for myocardial infarction compared with other ethnic groups. Unity and diversity indeed. So throughout the 20th century, coronary disease has been seen as a consequence of the mismatch between evolutionary pasts and modern contexts. South Asians in the Western imagination, especially in the New York Times, have come to epitomize this. The Indian re remain, India remains a land of ancient customs and ancient plagues. Outsiders continue to describe Indians as perversely resistant to the dictates of modern public health. But at the same time, India is a site of transformation. Economic growth within India has created striking juxtapositions of slum and skyscraper. South Asians in the diaspora are, are the new model immigrants, not just adapting to the United States, but thriving here. This allows many narratives of, of coronary disease to coexist. Thrifty genes might be a relic of India's ancient past. Mismatches of fetal and adult nutritional environments emerge from rapid modernization. Narratives of identity are equally open-ended. Despite acknowledgement of India's vast diversity, South Asians can still be presented and marketed to as a monolithic other. So in the setting of this ambiguity, what medical and public health responses might be appropriate? Popular media extensively promote their risk. One 2015 South Asian health blog warned that, quote, even if you are a slim vegetarian non-smoker with low cholesterol and average blood pressure, simply being Indian puts you at risk for these conditions. This one I put in for Dorothy. When the US Food and Drug Administration approved Bidil in 2005 for the treatment of heart failure in people who self-identify as black, an editorial in the Times of India wondered whether something similar could be done for Indians, quote, with the entry of a heart drug in the market meant exclusively for the blacks, shouldn't there be attempts to try out a formulation targeting Indians and their higher risk for contracting cardiac diseases? Medical entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley have attempted a different kind of personalized medicine. Mountain View's El Camino Hospital opened a South Asian heart center in 2006. Stanford launched, launched Safi in 2014. Safi offers its patients expert clinical and genetic evaluations to determine their risk. It then prescribes tailored treatment plans, nutritional guidance from a dietitian trained in South Asian cuisine, and if needed, referral to Stanford's interventional cardiologists and cardiac surgeons. However, aside from the claim of special risk, Safi's services are exactly the same that would be provided to any patient with coronary disease. Alyssa spent three days there last summer and confirmed that this is exactly what's going on. They recommend that everyone exercise more, eat better, take drugs if you need them. 
And genetic testing, even if intended to probe risk, can introduce its own risk. Arnab Chowdhury, an engineer at 23andMe, took advantage of one employee benefit, free ge genome scanning. He learned that he had a mutation in the myosin binding protein. He called his parents and learned that he had an extensive family history of heart disease. He went to his doctor, but neither his primary care doctor nor a cardiologist had ever heard of this mutation, and each dismissed his concerns. A geneticist took the results more seriously, but learned that Chowdhury's particular mutation was of unknown significance. This prompted a cardiac ultrasound, which found no evidence of cardiomyopathy. Chowdhury, however, was not reassured by the normal anatomic findings because he had this unknown genetic risk. He said, as an individual, this was unsatisfying. What could I do to empower myself? He redoubled his commitment to a healthy lifestyle, exercised more, lost weight, and ended up a healthier, if more anxious, South Asian man, <laughs> one who actually knew no more about his risk than his family history would have indicated. Public health responses have been contested as well. In 1955, the Indian government submitted a formal request to the World Health Organization. An organized drive against the ever-growing menace of coronary disease is urgently indicated. As far as, I can tell, as far as we can tell, this is the first time the World Health Organization was asked to examine coronary disease, and the request came from India in 1955, which makes very little sense. Uh, the program will not only demand expert scientific knowledge, but also a close appreciation and study of the sociological, environmental, economic, and dietetic patterns. Now, if the government took the Barker hypothesis seriously, it would seek to improve fetal nutrition. As, as Barker had wrote, prevention of the rising epidemic of the disease in India may require improvements in the nutrition and health of young women. This would be a different kind of South Asian heart paradox. To prevent coronary disease, so often seen as a disease of overweight older men, you would need to improve the nutrition of underweight young women. The Indian government, however, has done little. Cardiac care has largely been left to the private sector. Srinath Reddy, a cardiologist and president of the Public Health Foundation of India, blames an action on, quote, perceptions amongst both policymakers and the public that cardiovascular disease is largely a problem of the urban rich. He believes this is mistaken. The social gradient is now reversing for many cardiovascular risk factors and related events, with the poor becoming the dominant victims as the health transition from past to future advances the cardiovascular epidemic. Others disagree. Epidemiologist Subhu Subramanian and colleagues in England and India insist that cardiovascular disease deaths continue to occur disproportionately among the more economically advantaged groups. They argue that it is still a disease of the rich. They are worried that if the government took Srinath Reddy's advice and invest invested in cardiac care in India, this would increase inequity in India by shifting resources from the poor and the diseases they really suffer to the middle class and rich. This again is a debate about unity and disunity, this time not about race and ethnicity, but about class and narratives of economic development. I should add that I was in Delhi two weeks ago interviewing for this project, and Srinath Reddy is convinced that he's right and Subramanian is wrong, and that the socioeconomic gradient really has reversed in India, and this is now a disease of the poor there. So what should be done? The Wall Street Journal encourages Silicon Valley South Asian tech entrepreneurs to manage their current and future risk at boutique South Asian heart clinics. Indian elites can similarly access state-of-the-art cardiac care in any major Indian city, the perfect mix of opulence and care. The poor are ca caught in a temporal disjuncture. Are they still mired in diseases of the past and therefore safe from coronary disease, or do genetic and development, de developmental factors put them newly at risk when they encounter modernity, whether through immigration or through India's own economic growth? Identity is also in play. Do their shared histories from the Indian subcontinent create a kinship of cardiac risk that ties all South Asians together across discrepancies of nationality, ethnicity, religion, caste, class, and diet? Something about South Asian coronary disease appeals to patients, doctors, and researchers such that they finesse the complexities of genetics and history to operationalize these claims of susceptibility. It is important to try to understand why and to figure out what should be done. Thank you.
Well, kia ora everyone. Um, I understand I'm the lucky last, and they usually say save the best till last, but I don't know, today I must have got it backwards. But like everyone before me, just like to acknowledge Dorothy and Aram and, and, and all their team who have done an amazing job in bringing us all from around the world to be here. Um, I also understand being last that I'm the guy that separates you from getting home to dinner, so I'll, I'll make sure that I don't be that guy and I, I get through it before she holds up her sign. Um, but I, I wanted to talk today, uh, I guess a little bit about a project that we've been working on and, and just some concepts that we've been developing around weight and racism. Uh, this whole concept of weight and weight loss being maybe the, the, the thing we value most in health, particularly when it comes to lifestyle illnesses. Uh, and we, we often talk about it as a huge value. You see it on Facebook, uh, you see it on Twitter, you know, somebody loses some weight, it's a huge deal and it's amazing. But we often think that that's the end all and be all measure of, and, and success uh, of that, that's related to health. So I thought I'd start with just taking you through a bit of a, a trip, a bit of a story of how I got to this point. I, I'm a bit of a I'm, a, I'm an exercise physiologist, so a bit of a jock of the nerd world, I guess, or a nerd of the jock world, depending on which way you go, I guess. But um, while, doing, while doing my PhD and then heading into my postdoc, we started, I, I realised that, heck, we already know that exercise is good for you. It's going to uh, improve your health, reduce your risk of diabetes, things like that. And in New Zealand, Māori, um, I'm from um, Ngāti Te Ata, Te Arawa, uh, Tainui, these are different tribes in the, in the central North Island. Māori, just like it seems Mexico and, uh, and so many other places in the world, if you're brown, you have a higher risk of diabetes and heart disease and being overweight and every other thing you can think of. Just same, same thing in Māori. So it started off being, okay, I'm interested in exercise. I want to know what the best exercise is to improve metabolic measures, physiological measures of health and reduce the risk of diabetes. While doing that, we started doing qualitative research. Somehow along the way, I became this convert to qualitative subjective type research, um, which is a cardinal sin in some, some areas. But, um, and while doing that and hearing the story of the guys that we were um, doing these studies with, we had 40 Māori men in a small city in New Zealand, uh, and we put them through three different types of uh, exercise training. We did interviews at the beginning of the training, the 12 week training, and asked them, okay, what do you guys want to get out of it? And most of them said, oh, I want to be able to show my wife my guns and, and, and you know, show off a six pack abs by the end of the thing, you know. Fair enough, you know. But it was interesting that by the end of the 12 weeks, after training with these guys, and we made everything a group training and we really encouraged camaraderie, which is an important concept for Māori. Uh, this term for nongatanga, which is about making links and connections and identifying where you're from. At the end of the 12 weeks, not one guy, when I asked him, okay, what did you get out of this 12 weeks? Not one mentioned weight. Not one mentioned how they looked. Uh, they didn't care about their guns or their abs anymore. Uh, but what they, what they highlighted was one, this camaraderie, this friendship that they had established, that their families were doing better, that they had a better mood. And so we talk about these holistic outcome measures of exercise, of, of diet, of all of these uh, different lifestyle changes, but oftentimes we focus so much on the weight that those outcome, measure, outcome measures, although we have highlighted them in research and practice, it's not translated uh, into our practice, I guess you could say. And so um, at first it was all about appearance, by the end of it they didn't really care. Um, funny thing, or not, not so funny actually, was Everyone wanted to know their results. How much weight did I lose? How much body fat percentage? All these things. And so, sure enough, I gave them their results and I really didn't want to. A third of the guys hadn't lost any weight, hadn't lost any, any had made any changes in body fat, um, hadn't changed anything in regards to diabetes risk or fasting insulin or anything. And as expected, I gave them the results and they were just gutted. They were, they were destroyed, this third of the guys. What about that guy? He lost all this weight and he, he had lost all this body fat. What about me? How come I haven't lost that? And we could argue about genetics or diet or, and different things like that. But when a guy who you've gone through 12 weeks of training with and this kind of uh, built this, we, we call whanaungatanga, whānau is, is a term associated with be, being family, 
where we've literally become family with our research participants. When they, when they say that, you realise, oh, I always thought Māori men, I thought macho Māori men, we, we weren't affected by that whole weight message. But then you think about uh, the biggest loser and, and things like that and all these happy people losing weight. But what about the people who don't lose weight a, a particular week? They get kicked off the show. And what kind of message does that send us? That weight is the end all and be all, the uh, measure of success. And if you don't lose weight, you're unsuccessful. And so those, those uh, messages were making it through to our men. Um, so it made me think, okay, well, is measuring weight, one, is it necessary? Uh, and two, does it, is it doing more harm than good? particularly for Māori. Now, for, interestingly, Māori, uh, like anybody of colour, uh, we also tend to be, like I said before, heavier or disproportionately heavier, and therefore the institutionalised racism, the soci societal racism that we suffer is compounded by the fact that then we suffer the stigma of weightism as well. I don't know if that's a term, but we'll use it. So... Often in the media, we get portrayed as sick, uh, obe obese Māori, and, or you can insert race here, insert whatever colour here. Um, weight loss equals success, but what is overweight equal? Laziness. Uh, it equals poverty, uh, equals poor health. And so therefore those of colour who are disproportionately affected who have all, already gone through that in regards to their race and colour, now in uh, a modern day where lifestyle illness is increasing, now we have to go through the double-edged sword of that. And so when, when Europeans first came to New Zealand, the majority of our population was wiped out by communicable diseases. Now, 150 or more years later, not as old as you guys, 150 or 160 more years later, now we're getting wiped out by non-communicable diseases, diseases, still associated with, with, um, uh, with colonisation. So, why do we measure weight? I've, I've often asked GP, um, general practitioners, uh, physician, family physicians, why do we even measure weight? Oh, well, that's a great idea to, to not make weight the focus, is what usually the answer, but we've got to measure it. It's an easy way for us to understand uh, health or health risk. But easy isn't a good reason, good enough reason to do something that may potentially be harmful, right? Now, the other the other thing with uh, with weight is um, was well, part of the status quo. To get funding in New Zealand, uh, oftentimes, particularly around lifestyle illnesses, you have to show that you, if it's an intervention, that you're going to improve. Is it going to be weight loss? Yeah. Despite the fact that even the World Health Organization has highlighted that health is a is um, a, is holistic in nature, including psychological, uh, physical, even spiritual, social uh, aspects of health. For Māori, we've highlighted the same thing as, as many indigenous groups and many other ethnic, ethnic groups have highlighted. But once again, it hasn't translated into practice. Whenever we do an exercise intervention, being an exercise guy, what do we measure? We measure weight. We measure a whole lot of physical, physiological markers. Yet, uh, in New Zealand, we have uh, Māori, and I, I kind of had a chuckle when we talked about uh, the South Asian cardiac uh, kind of an intervention there where you go there and it's exactly the same as any other place would give you. We have Māori health interventions where uh, we highlight this, this holistic well-being, psychological, social, spiritual well-being, also an in inclusion of our connection to land, but yet we, the only outcome measure we measure is weight or diabetes risk. So what's the point of highlighting a holistic model of health and then not measuring it at the end. Now, what's the worst that can help? I guess the question I pose is, what's the worst that can happen if we done away with the scales? What's the worst? The answer I got from, from one of our, our public health uh, experts uh, um, in New Zealand was, oh yeah, well then we can start measuring um, waist circumference. <laughs> I thought, I, you've totally missed my point here. But. <laughs> and so, once again, 
measurable, uh, non-holistic measures of health, despite the fact that what we value is holistic measures of health. To us, weight, uh, measuring weight, and particularly because we tend to be the, the heavier uh, end of, of the ethnicities in New Zealand, is another form of colonisation. You know, and we, we talked, I, I heard the term post-colonisation today, I don't really like that term because colonisation is still going. It never really finished. Uh, it's also another form of racism and, it, and it's another way of supporting and perpetuating uh, racial, racist type thinking. So, the alternative. Ba, ba, ba. So, this is um, Tairawera. This is uh, uh, my maunga, my mountain, ancestral mountain. This is where my family's from and that, that lake in front of it's also called Tairawera. So in New Zealand, um, much like my man was saying, we also bury our, um, our placenta. Now the name, the, the word for land, uh, where we're from, is called whenua. Funny enough, the word for placenta is also whenua. The thing that sustained us, the thing that provided for us. And so when we disconnect from that, from that uh, original whenua, or ri from, from that uh, placenta, then the land is what sustains us. So what happens when you take that land away? One, our identity, it's, it's hard to be Māori if, there's, we, if we don't have a land to identify with. And two, the, the, the structures, the social structures, the uh, environmental structures that were in place for us to survive are taken away and poverty, poor health, all the results of that. Now, some of the alternatives that we've come up with is we've got a, we've got a whakatauki, it's a, it's a proverb, a Māori proverb, and it says, uh, kia, kia whakatō muri te, uh, te haere whakamua. And what it basically means is walk into the future uh, with your back, uh, walk backwards into the future facing the past. And so what we've thought is, well, oftentimes when we've tried to resolve our uh, health issues, we've tried to use a colonised Western way of thinking. The very uh, frame of mind or very lens to which caused these problems in the first place. And so we thought, okay, well, let's look back into the past. And because we've lost a lot of our knowledge, a lot of that's experimentation. Uh, now, so I've, I've got a few cases, a couple of cases, two good friends of mine, Dr. Ihirangi Heke, left uh, academia to uh, go out and to promote uh, exercise and health with his people, uh, and Paura to Huri Hanganui. I'll give a brief uh, story about these two. Now, Dr. Heke, he was put in a place, that, a rural place in the eastern part of uh, the North Island in New Zealand, in a place that's, that's a high Māori population, and he was told, get those people active. We've got a lot of obesity there, we've got a lot of heart disease, a lot of diabetes. So he went there and he went, when we introduce each other, we go on our ancestral meeting house, which we call our marae, and we introduce ourselves, not our names first, but we introduce ourselves, ko Tarawera Te Maunga, ko Tainui Te Waka, ko uh, Waikato Te Awa. So Tarawera is my mountain, Waikato is my river, Tainui is my waka, my boat, that, that our, our canoe that our people came, came to New Zealand on. And then at the very end, ko Isaac Warbury talking my name's Isaac. We do that because we literally descend from our mountains and our rivers. Now, when we talk about that in a Western sense, like we've talked about today, that seems really strange, you know? What do you mean, burying your placenta, like you said, yeah? But when we think of that in the ecology or even epigenetics, Anybody understands that when rain falls on a mountain, a mountain turns into a river, that, that rain from the mountain turns into a river. Within that river, we drink the water or there's fish in that water that we eat. And each one of each of those become part of the cells of, in our body, right? So why is that so strange that we say that we literally descend from, from a mountain or river? Because we literally do, and there's science to back it up. So we knew those things long before scientists ever, ever came up with those ideas, right? But anyway, so he, he, would go, he went to this community, he said, okay, there's this mountain right here. All of you have stood up and told me today that that's where you descend from. How many of you have been up there? And they were, oh, no hands went up. And he said, okay, well, I'm going up there tomorrow. I'm not from here, but I'm gonna to get to know your mountain better than you. <laughs> and these guys were like, oh, oh where are we coming to? And he's like, okay, I'm leaving at 4.30 in the morning. So they all got up at 4.30 in the morning and they went up this place. He said, okay, well, now, 
How many of you guys have paddled in your river or swam in your river? And, 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 and they said, oh, none of us. So he went swimming with them. Six months later, I went up to visit, visit him. And uh, he said, oh, I want to show you something. So we got up about 5.30, went up to this mountain, and I could see headlamps, little torches, little lights, flashlights coming down the mountain. About 40 people up and down. He said, bro, I don't even, I don't even take them up anymore. Because they go because they want to know their mountain. They want to connect and know the places that their ancestors went because that's what drives them. Rather than weight loss, he's never, never talked to them about weight loss. In fact, he said, okay, anyone gets to the top, we'll give you chocolate bars. We'll all have chocolate bars together. And this is a weight loss intervention, you know. My other man over here, Paura Te Huri Hanganui, he, uh, so he was quite overweight and he was suffering health problems and he thought, okay, what do I need to do to reconnect? And he had this amazing kind of experience, but I'll, I'll cut it short. And basically um, said that for him, what came to him was he needed to go back to the food that his ancestors ate. Nothing, anything that his people didn't need 150 years ago, he wouldn't need it. And it, it got pretty intense. He started having to knock off a few birds that were protected and semi-illegal. <laughs> um, and, and, and catch a few extra fish and things like that. But, but, and eventually he realised, well, that wasn't practical, so he substituted it for chicken or something like that. But what he, what he found was the, the food wasn't about weight loss, it wasn't about health, it was about cultural reconnection. It was about a spiritual experience, a cultural experience, rather than what, what a scale dictated. Uh, and so we've been playing around with a lot of different ideas here about what it, what it means to, look with, to, walk forwards back, to walk backwards looking back on the past. It's a lot easier to say in Māori. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so for me, meeting in between, because a lot of my work is at the interface of very Western physiological type science and indigenous type of approaches to, uh, to research. And I'm really interested on how we can use our knowledge to then apply it in modern day settings to give us some kind of cultural relevance to the approach that we use. And so we've been playing around in the gym with telling stories, telling our cultural stories within an exercise uh, session. You know, people do it in dance all the time, on Broadway, they tell stories, so why can't I do it through exercise? And with the, the feedback that I get from these guys is, you know what, my whole life I've heard these stories as a kid, uh, or I've, I've read them in books, but I never thought that they had relevance for me today. And I think that's an important point, is that our culture, our uh, cultural narratives, our histories have relevance to us now. The knowledge which shaped us and enabled us to survive has relevance to our health and our well-being now. And finishing and wrapping up, uh, there's been a lot of talk about uh, genes today, genetics, um, and there's a lot of talk even back home. When I when I mentioned to one of the aunties, oh, oh you've got to look after yourself. You know, you've got to make sure you take your your meds for your diabetes. We'll do some exercise with you, eat well, whatever. And usually the response you get, oh, we just got bad genes, you know, and, and joking. And I like to challenge and say, well, actually we survived ocean voyages, we survived starvation and famines. We survived um, a whole lot of diseases that came through colonisation. And so if we're here, we come from a strong a gene pool, right? Not a weak one. And that's especially relevant to, to those who were affected through colonisation, not only by their lands being taken, but being forcefully taken to another land. That we actually descend from a strong gene pool. There's nothing weak about our genes, but we're in a, in a situation, in an environment where our genes don't respond well. Thank you. I told you they were gonna be really good. So, as I said, the title of this uh, panel was Past and Promise. I think that was an absolutely fitting title uh, for this uh, wonderful panel and this wonderful meeting. So uh, I'm just gonna say a few words and ask a question of each of our speakers. Um, I would say in contrast to what Sebastian said this morning, um, he made a comment I think about how we've traveled through some unexpected places and practices of global science. 
But as the day went on, I, I realized that we've been having very familiar encounters, familiar categories, familiar ca classification systems that translate the social into the scientific and the scientific into the social. We've listened to familiar biological and biogenomic narratives. We've encountered ghosts of un unarticulated colonial and eugenics past. We have seen categories create new, identi new identities and reify old identities. So, and these papers this afternoon take us from Nigeria to South Asia through Britain to New Zealand. And I just wanted to first state this sort of uncannily familiar, but different terrains and practices that we've traversed today. So I thought of the question that David and his work with Alyssa ask, uh, what is a South Asian? We've also asked, what is a Bantu? Uh, what is a Maori? Uh, but we haven't spent a whole lot of time asking, what is a Caucasian? The sort of unreferenced, norm against a lot of what we're talking about has been uh, a response to. And so I wanted to start asking David if he would elaborate just a bit further about the interests that are served when the question of what is the South Asian is consistently elided, but absolutely necessary for the work that people are trying to do by drawing attention to these risk factors for coronary um, disease. If you don't know what a Maori is, I mean, if you don't know what a South Asian is, you don't know what a Maori is, then how do you persist? What is, what is driving? What's, that, what's driving that, that, that work when a fundamental aspect of the question is not ever articulated? For Kristen, um, I thought about the claim that you've made about ethical misrecognition not being a clinical aberration or a misunderstanding among parties, but clinical mis ethical misrecognition, sorry, is a structure of knowledge. And so my question would be, how do we, if you could tell us a little bit more, I should say, about the relationship between this kind of ethical misrecognition and the unthinkable. Is it an ethics that's unthinkable or is it that the unthinkable is the absolute impossibility that Africans could have anything to say about the conduct of scientific practice that affect their own bodies and their own communities? And for Isaac, I, we return again to the question of obesity, which came up earlier today as a racial marker, but it's not a stable marker at all. And I think I'd like to hear some more about the perceptions of obesity itself uh, among the minority? Is it, is it seen as a sort of aspect of identity uh, or is it seen as some uh, identity that's being projected upon them? Um, and that returning to their own sort of cultural practices both reclaims their identity and reclaims their bodies in the interesting and incredible ways that, that you describe. And I think about it that way because in the US for a long time, some clinicians argued that African Americans' refusal to quote unquote refusal to lose weight is because they, they, they valued people of higher weight. That we value big women, we like big women. That's what people would argue about uh, African Americans. But that was, that was, that sort of comment led to practices that ignored the economic aspects that drive obesity, this thing called obesity. And in fact, we should be asking why obesity, just as, as Isaac did. And why not economic, why, why is it the focus obesity and not economic deprivation, right? Why not those kinds of structures? So I'd like to hear just a little bit more about the, 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 those kinds of issues facing the Maori. And so at the end, I, I, I do think we, we talked a lot about uh, the most, I think, significant things having to do with the subtitle of the conference on uh, global science and racial reason, but I do think we do have to, as we can talk about the construction of new identities, identities and the reification of old, the what is a Caucasian is like an unanswered question in the room. And until we can deal with what is a Caucasian, that constructed category of power and privilege, I think uh, we need that in order to continue our unraveling all the situations that we've described today. So. Yeah. So it's preaching my mom. Jiggly eggs. 
chat like he's getting to. Yeah. Um, I think I mean, it's, it's a thing with um, being a colonised people is oftentimes you take upon yourself the, the way that what's been portrayed upon you. you know? mm -hmm. So yes, being uh, overweight or being obese is part of our identity. I don't think it's traditionally part of our identity. It's definitely not traditionally part of our identity. You know, there was no such thing as overweight Māori prior to colonisation. Uh, but yeah, we've definitely uh, taken that on board. <laughs> it's become part of our psyche. Um, everyone has family that's diabetic, uh, that's ha had a heart attack. So yeah, it has, but, which isn't a good thing. What was the other party question, sorry? So how do, how do people begin to think about obesity versus, where's the economic deprivation part contributing yeah. to that and how, how people think about that? Yes, yeah, a good point. I mean, like has like been identified all over the world, there's a, the hu a strong, very strong association between economic depravity and, and obesity. And we talked about um, determinants of health. Uh, and where am I going with this? <laughs> and um, for us, I mean, because when I, when, I, when I talk about how outcome measures don't reflect our values, so what does that look like? What does, what does an outcome measure based on traditional knowledge or traditional values even look like? And that's something I think that we have to start experimenting with. Um, for us, we, we uh, proposed this term of wakapapa, which is kind of like a, it's kind of like genealogy, but it's also ex uh, understanding our histories and, and everything that's made us us, almost almost a part of epigenetics as well. And so we, we propose, well, okay, what's a particular ancestor that you have? They were able to run. Okay, what could they do? They were able to run over a mountain range, fight a battle, run back. Okay, how do you measure up to them? Mm, rather than a, rather than um, a scale per se. Um, and so for us, it's just about decolonizing the way that we think, because I think the fact that we've taken obesity on board as part of identity, our identity is because colonization is not only our land being taken and things like that, it's, it's our minds, obviously, and the way that we think about ourselves, and we adopt that colonizing, colonized way of thinking. Probably didn't answer your question, but <laughs> I'll, I'll blame it on jet lag. <laughs> So, so Evelyn, I had two questions for you. What's the role of the Caucasian and what, what interests are served? So one of the things that's been, been interesting, I don't have a full answer to this, uh, is the role of Caucasian in this whole South Asian discourse. Because most physical anthropologists, if pressed, would confess that at least Northwest South Asians are Caucasian. Uh, and and there, there might be clinal gradients. By the time you get down to Kerala, you might not be in Caucasian. But you know, there, there's, a, there's a huge gray area. And so there's this discomfort by wanting to say, these South Asians are the other, you know, we colonize them. And yet they're also Caucasian. Uh, and I think there are echoes of that. Like when you see all the discussions now of like the South Asians as the model minority, uh, there's much less threat in that discourse now, I think. I mean, some, some, some of you might disagree with this, but you know, when, in the 80s when I was in high school and the, you know, the East Asian immigrants were the model minority, there was something of the yellow peril in that discourse that you don't see at all, or I don't see at all now in the South Asians as the model minority. And I wonder if that has something to do with this uncertain affinity that, well, they, these are all Caucasians. It's mm -hmm. okay for them to be successful. Um, if, you, if you look at the epidemiological literature, the, the comparator for the South Asian population is different in different contexts. So in, in the, the first study from 1959 in Singapore, it was a comparison of South Asian and Chinese. The Caucasian was not the refer, reference point. Uh, and if you look at the London studies, it's you know, whoever happened to be there. So one of the tables is South Asians, Italians, Poles, uh, I forget what the other groups are, probably Afro-Caribbean. And so it's always a moving target. The, the, the California studies, where you know, the this, this supposedly 3.7 came, came from, again, was a comparison of South Asians to East Asians. So in this literature, the Caucasians aren't always the reference point. It's not always, it's, it's always black versus white in the US literature, as you know very well. The South Asian literature, the comparison is often different depending on the context, but the conclusion is always that whoever that you're comparing them to, South Asians have the, the worst levels of disease. Um, so what interests are served by, by doing this? Uh, like with so, so much of the race disparity literature in the US, a lot of these, if you talk to the people who do these South Asian claims, 
it's always a narrative of inadvertent discovery. Like they didn't go out to find race. They weren't trying to label this population. So they, they were just looking at the data, and they couldn't help but notice that the signal was in the data. And once it's been recognized, how can you not yep. do something about it? Uh, and so they're often very apologetic about this. And it becomes, well, it's just an empirical public health disparity. Therefore, we need to do something about it. Uh, but then if you push behind that, you can see all, all sorts of interesting things coming up. If you talk to the surgeons who con continue to insist, despite the absence of data to confirm this, that South Asians have smaller coronary arteries than other human populations, uh, that claim is almost always embedded in claims of nationalist pride that these are the hardest people in the world and we are the only ones that can operate on them because we are actually the best cardiac surgeons because we have been taught to operate on people who have the smallest coronary arteries. And I've been told very specific stories. You know, rich South Asian patients used to go to Houston. The Houston surgeons would call the surgeons in India and say, what's wrong with your patients? Their arteries are too small. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and so the Indian surgeons would say, well, we learned how to do this and we are now the best surgeons uh, in the world. You know, the debate between Srinath Reddy and Subhu Subramanian is a debate over how best to help the poor. Everyone wants to help the poor in global health. But the question is, well, how best to do that? Do you do that by focusing on coronary disease or arguing or ignoring coronary disease? And it depends on how you read the data, which problem you want to do. Uh, and Alyssa and I had long talks about how cynically to write about the Stanford <laughs> Clinic. Uh, and it's hard not to write cynically about them. And it, the, and it is, way it's like you know, fishing in a, in a bucket. Some of the stuff they do is so ripe for analysis by people in STS. Uh, but it really seems like they're really trying to just extract resources from Silicon Valley, uh, which is a, obviously a resource-rich environment. Like you know, the guy who set up the clinic, Rakesh Dash, Alyssa said, you know, well, what was your interest in this? And he said, well, I, I finished my cardiology fellowship at Stanford. I wanted to stay on faculty at cardiology uh, at Stanford. If you're going to be on the faculty, you have to have a research project. I didn't know what I wanted to do. He, you know, he's trained as an ultrasound person. He said, well, I heard about the South Asian thing. I'm South Asian, so maybe I would look into this. Uh, and it wasn't sort of born of deep commitment to solving this problem. He, just, he needed something to do. There were all these people who had money who could support his, clinic, his research projects. Uh, and so it was a match made in heaven for him. Uh, and certainly, if you look at the advertising uh, in India for these very high-end heart centers, when I mean, they're clearly targeting the anxieties of the Indian elites uh, to try to get them to come to these medical centers. Uh, so there are all sorts of interests at play. So you asked if, it, if this was a question of ethics or is this a question of unthinkability, right? Um, so one, <clears throat> I mean, doing this research over the years, um, we've encountered a number of, you know, these kind of like corridor whispers of all of these various trials that were marred by like you know ethical violations but they don't really come out in the public and and there was um, a number of you know kind of underground consortiums and across the african continent like discussing all of this and so one of the things that <clears throat> we were interested in doing was try, trying to you know sort of put an explanation of persistence, right? To think about, like, why does this continue to happen? And <clears throat> in many ways, the, the work here is following the Brazilian critical theorist, um, Denise Ferreira de Silva, who wrote a book in <clears throat> 2009 called The Global Idea of Race. <clears throat> Excuse me. And what she did in there, and she, she asked a similar question that I asked in the talk. She says, why is it that there's no ethical crisis when black people are continually killed by state or extra state means? And so what she does is she goes back to Kant and to Hegel and to Herder and all of the kind of European philosophical foundations. And w one way that she answers that question, which I think is a subtle but kind of profound shift in the ways in which race is usually dealt with today. She says that European man, with a capital M's, self-determination is not dictated by how to include Europe's others within a racial hierarchy where European man is at the top. But instead, she argues that 
really, when you read this work, that self-determination is um, achieved through the obliteration of the other, through the elimination of the other, which is a very different kind of um, sort of modality to work with when we're talking, especially in the US, when we're talking about diversity and inclusion, right? So, um, so the question of, un you know, it is about, un and, and, and so what she's actually trying to do here is sort of think about um, an ethico-political framework. Like this is, this is what race means, this is how it is framed. And underneath that, obviously, so if we take the case that I'm talking about, the pushback on the Nigerian scientists is, is the this, this sort of, the potential to a sort of self-determination, right? A, a potential to what a kind of liberatory framework of research could look like. And they have all kinds of ideas of what that, that could mean. And so, um, and so I am trying to think about these politics as an ethics, as an ethical structure that's been in play for, since the foundations of the Enlightenment, right? And, and then the question that gets begged then is that, well then what does a liberatory framework then look like once it comes to bear on that? So, um, it's not just unthinkability. I have a whole kind of list of things that kind of constitute this ethical political regime, as if we want to call it that. And so that's kind of the most prominent sort of, um, um, I would say, sensibility towards how that got managed. So yeah, thank you for the question. the reference of that ethics, the ethics of the ethics uh, you are talking about. Is it ethically unthinkable according to the global yeah. canon that is used, that is very much yeah. Judeo-Christian mm -hmm. ethics? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or ethically unthinkable according to a completely different canon of ethics that could be used elsewhere? Yeah. Um, I, I would say that it's not like a conscious ethics, right, on the part of the kind of this of these transnational research consortiums. It's it's simply the ways in which one inhabits sort of a racial understanding once these researchers from sort of North Atlantic countries encounter sort of the African researcher, right? That first and foremost, the racial is the thing, well, there's, I didn't get much into it into the talk, but there's also a political economy also that's at work here, right? And a, and a certain sort of imperial history, obviously, that comes to bear upon that encounter. And so what I'm arguing is that within this, that ethics, takes place, like how people understand a kind of universal ethics actually is framed inside of this racial encounter. Yes, exactly, I agree with you. And that's, that's the breakdown. We've, we've been having these discussions in New Zealand about, um, especially around health professionals, and they might be clinically competent, you know, they might be competent uh, physicians or nurses, but if they're not culturally competent, are they actually a competent physician or a nurse? And that, that relates to researchers as well. Okay. You know, if you're, if you're a competent researcher, you're considered a competent researcher, but you don't have cultural competence, yeah. and you're working in a space where, there's, where you're navigating different worldviews and things, yeah. are you a competent researcher? You know, so I think that's, you've got to have those discussions, eh? So my question's for David. Uh, so I was wondering, like, the first study that you showed on the genetic thing had lots of authors, uh, but on the last line, David Reich was there 
Lalji Singh, Kumar Thangaraj, all people, I mean, right, is, I'll put it on the side for the moment, but <laughs> <laughs> Lalji Singh and Kumar Thangaraj are very much associated in South Asian media with people who've been doing caste genetics and trying to say, determine where castes fit in into uh, ancient North Indians, ancient South Indians, all that stuff. So I was wondering, like, is it making a difference that these guys are making a different kind of claim about unity and diversity, whereas in India they seem to be emphasizing diversity? So what's the role of space uh, and the forum at which they're talking? Most of the things you showed were sort of international journals uh, or people based at big Delhi institutes who are part of international networks, be that the Public Health Foundation, be that AIMS people. Uh, but is it going to be different if you look at people, so you know, South Asians get consolidated into one thing in these transnational networks. But if you were looking at a guy who's doing research in say Allahabad or Lucknow or some smaller city that's not as bad, well networked into this transnationalism, are they going to emphasize like differential rates for different castes, or which is something that like I associate with Lalji Singh doing? So, so I, I suspect you could give a much better answer to that question than Alyssa and I could. The for the we we started to dig into the genomics stuff now, uh, and you, you quickly realize if you do that, it is a fiercely contested domain at present. Uh, and there are, there are at least two main camps, and I don't know who all the actors are, other than obviously David Reich is a colleague, so I have a sense of what, what's going on there. Uh, and they're making, so anytime one side publishes some, some report, there'll be a fierce reaction from the other camps. And so that article uh, that many authors published along with David Reich got a very fierce uh, reaction in the blogosphere from people who have other kinds of commitments. And so it'd be interesting to know to what extent, you know, are, behind all of this, there must be some shades of the Hindu nationalist movement because that has affected all sectors of academia. Uh, and so I, it's hard for me to tell exactly what the stakes are. And the, the part of the backstory is there was very little work done on Indian genomics in the 1990s because when the big multinational groups started doing their global sampling, uh, most researchers in India and the Indian government didn't want to cooperate on the grounds that, you know, that there was some kind of Indian bio capital. Uh, and other scholars have, have described this. Uh, but recently it has opened up, and so there have been groups of local Indian gen genetics consortiums doing this kind of work, and then there have been collaborative and multinational groups. Uh, and they are definitely at odds with each other. Uh, for the most part, it's been easier, easiest for us to sort of dodge these contemporary debates in the genomics and, and go back deeper into the history. Uh, in hopes that by the time we finish getting the earlier history right, <laughs> the genomics will have settled out and there'll be a story we, we can tell. Uh, but, you, but you see parallels to that in the 1960s. So in the 1960s, you start to see the first big studies of cardiovascular epidemiology in India. Some of them are done by seemingly random guys at small institutes in India. Some of them are done by people who had come to the US or UK for training. Like, you know, some of these people are currently trained with a Framingham Heart Study. They go back and then do Framingham Heart Study-like things in mm -hmm. India. Other people are doing, some of them are actually collaborative work. And so even in the 60s, you can see these different modes of research with different levels of elite institutions. Uh, and that's a story that's much easier for us to trace because there is a fewer number of people, uh, the stories have mostly resolved. And so we're trying to master that stuff first in hopes that eventually we'll be able to provide the answer to you on. But you know, the, the genomic stuff, uh, and not surprisingly, and as Evelyn said, you know, you, you, familiar stories keep getting told in new contexts. Uh, the stakes of these claims of how many populations settled in India, which directions did they come from, who has mm, uh, yeah. the northwest, who, who, who came in from the northeast, who came in from the south, mm -hmm. are there any traces of African ancestry? Uh, and this, these are all very fraught questions. Anybody else? I mean, I think it is important to have this connection, as you showed, mm. you know, with 
ancestors and cultures and land, and I, I hope we do more of it, uh, all of us, and at the same time, how can we prevent the kind of uh, stigmatization or the kind of segmentation mm -hmm. of society that are, of course, also the very fuel of race and racism? Mm -hmm. So, um, I know we just do it. <laughs> um, yeah, in New Zealand, we, uh, it was interesting to hear all the, the different uh, discussions and, about um, how the definitions of race and ethnicity. In New Zealand, I'm Māori. You know, obviously, I've got ancestry from Ireland, and Scotland, and Spain, and all over the place. I'm Māori. Someone, no one can you know, quantify how Māori I am. And if anybody did, there'd be, there'd be uh, protest all over the place, you know? Right. It's, it's quite strange for me being here and, and, and hearing, you know, that quantification, you have this amount of parents and, mm. who, or grandparents that are things. So, yeah, I don't know, we just do it. <laughs> we, uh, if there is pushback, obviously. Uh, there is um, the same kind of racist... Uh, neoliberal type views looking at, um, you know, you, you Māori, uh, you know, it's your fault that you're fat, it's your fault that you're lazy, it's your fault that you're poor because you make bad decisions, all these things. It's, it's a very individualistic approach. The only way that we found to combat it is really, okay, well, we're just going to do it, do it anyway, you know. We can write grants and get funding uh, and be a little bit tricky with the wording, but um, generally, we go about and yeah. When it comes to the intervention, because we're experimenting and because we're trying to use not our full understanding of traditional knowledge, but trying to utilise. Okay, how do we do that without it getting tokenistic as well? You know, you would have seen Moana. My daughter's watched it a million times. Uh, <laughs> And, and Maui, uh, there was a huge discussion about, okay, well, Maui was portrayed as this overweight. How come you've got this hero that's overweight Polynesian? Mm -hmm. And although, although I don't agree with Disney taking our stories and making a whole lot of money out of, the, out of it, but um, I thought it was actually quite cool that you've got this thriving, strong hero that's actually overweight. He's portrayed as bigger than the general <laughs> buffed hero, and I thought, there we go, we've finally got someone that we've put up there on a pedestal that doesn't conform to, um, you know, to the typical white body, you know, they, they, yeah. Uh, now, yeah, I'm not too sure how to, how to answer that in this context because, and, and particularly where you are as well, because it's very different in New Zealand. Self-identified ethnicity, that's it, you know. You still get people the uh, looking at us there's oh wait but you look at your face you're, you're white and how can you say you're Māori you know oh you've got one parent that's white and one parent that's Māori I'm Māori you can't <laughs> you can't argue with it you know it's just the way it is back home but yeah so that's a difficult one anyone else have an answer to that? <laughs> <laughs> well, the last question I just a comment following um, Maori brother there. Mm. So, and, and also your question. I think it's extremely difficult. How do you um, maybe take those information? Or, let's say the dissociation once again between what we perceive as as, as difference or the construct of the difference, uh, politically, ideologically, economically generated, um, and what is the reality? I think probably the, one of the answers is the search of information. The second is the restoration of stolen legacy, uh, mm. maybe what, what he's been doing. And um, probably also the changes of the colonial science we are still doing up, up to now in terms of the language of, of science. Uh, even the publishing, I think I'm, I'm, I like your comment regarding the, the references in the David's, uh, David's presentation. Um, sometimes those established big journals have a very unique direct way, direction way of publishing. So it would be even very difficult for someone from a different type of university to publish there while the information is absolutely scientifically correct. So once again, this a level of sand, a colonial publishing, it needs to, to fit a certain type of discourse. I think the only way to contact is to bring the type of talk I've heard this morning here and get it across. Um, not, 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 be, not to be afraid to have a different um, um, 
provocative uh, opinion, uh, not to be afraid to have a very different way of teaching. I remember uh, I was giving a lecture on mitochondria inheritance. Uh, for those that are geneticists or not geneticists, mitochondria is the only gene content that we have from our mom and that our dad have not contributed to. In fact, when we say mom have energy, it's absolutely true, it's factually true. <laughs> Because it's, it's our energy is from our mitochondria. It's the only, and our, our dad have not contributed to that. And to come back to that umbilical cord and placenta thing, mm. and when I was talking about that concept, when I say the heredity here is mitochondria, it's like the Kirtu concept, like the umbilical burial concept, because it's, it's what links you to your mom and so on. And it was very, very clear to the community who was teaching that. So, so some of this knowledge, first of all, I think we, we have to, there's a lot of, it's a difficult to answer, answer by the way, so, <laughs> but there's a lot of things that need to be amended in terms of knowledge, in terms of colonial knowledge, colonial science, even the way it's practiced now, uh, science policy and diplomacy is still very much colonial. So if there's a big program which I'm part of, which is called H3 Africa, Human Heredity and How to Do Genomics in Africa, but if you look at the major project in that project, most of the projects are non-communicable, let's say diseases like high blood pressure, diabetes. That is a challenge now genetic-wise for the Western society. But the very first phase of the funding did not include like sickle cell anemia, which is the number one condition of humankind and number one in Africa. So once again, that colonial policy that follows a specific priority from the West, but not necessarily from Africa. So, I, so it's, it's, it's much more complex than, than that and would require attentive type of science to, to come out and, and to be visible. Okay, welcome to you. First, thank you very much. So, we come to the end of this symposium. I'm, I have to say, you know, when you plan a symposium, we, I had lots and lots of wonderful people working with me, and thank you all for doing, but you're never quite sure how it's going to turn out. And I know I am excited and just thrilled with all of the papers presented and the commentators and questions from the audience. Everything was so enlightening. Uh, I think both Sebastian and, where are you, there you are, and Evelyn are both right, <laughs> that there were lots of surprising aspects of how race is used around the world that I didn't know about before, even though I've spent a career studying it, I learned so much, but yet, as Evelyn said, so much is the same, what, what you know, what, Ahmad was talking about the use of forensics to identify people and how it's so racialized. The, what uh, Isaac just spoke about, the uh, racialization of weight. Um, I, I could go on and on with everybody's uh, talk where there's familiar, familiar ways that race is used to explain away social injustice. Uh, and biologized in new ways with new technologies, and yet it's the, that same logic that seems to follow us generation after generation after generation, how it continues to be embedded in medicine in ways that we can see from uh, the slave trade. To both, both of those aspects were so, so vivid in uh, all of the talks today. And then also I again have to thank all of the panelists for how they, I don't know if it was the way we chose you or if you just <laughs> obeyed our command to speak on these particular themes, but uh, the themes were perfectly matched to the papers, I thought, and vice versa. And so I, I really thank you for that. And then also, uh, as we saw in this last panel and, and throughout the others as well, lots of criticism of the way that race has been used historically and continues to be used, but also ideas for how we can break away 
uh, some in, on this panel some alternatives to the values and the ethics of racialization that give us hope, I think, that this work might actually, at some point, maybe not in our lifetimes, but at some point, if we continue to show the harm of the original invention of race and how it's reconstituted, and we can imagine a world that isn't shaped by it, despite the possibility that maybe we can't get away from sameness and difference, but certainly we can think of better ways of organizing ourselves than the ones that have continued to lead to so much damage, death, and suffering. So I am just so grateful to everyone who helped to put this symposium together, all the speakers and commentators, and you uh, in the audience who have been here uh, all day. Thanks so much, and have a wonderful, warm <laughs> weekend. Uh, it's supposed to be 80 degrees. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye.